Hey guys, pardon my sunburn. I was sick of looking at my pale face in the mirror, so I spent Wednesday at the beach trying to catch up on my reading. I may have overdone the sunbathing a little bit. You'd think that I'd know my own skin by now and that ball of fire up in the sky, but I guess there are lessons we have to learn over and over again. I've been doing a deep dive into China for an upcoming series of videos. Learning about Mao's revolution for a few weeks is pretty frightening stuff. I've just finished a book of essays written by one of China's greatest living authors. He was a child when the Cultural Revolution upended all of Chinese history so that Mao Zedong could follow in the footsteps of Joseph Stalin. The horror that this utopian dream has imposed on the simple people of this planet is hard to grasp. I read the accounts and I marvel at the cruelty, the staggering inhumanity of man toward man, the almost unlimited evil that people can do to each other and to themselves when some bold egomaniac grabs hold of their imaginations. I was raised to believe that we were created by a loving deity, made in his own image. Sometimes I feel that when I'm with the people I care about, maybe playing music or working on a project together, pitching in to be of service to our fellow humans, our fellow children of God, if you will. At those times, I can see why I was raised to look deep inside myself for a glimpse of the divine. Now and then I catch that glimpse in myself and in others, but it's fleeting and hard to hold on to. We have wandered very far from the garden, my friends. Every day, billions of eyes and ears soak up an infinite stream of sounds and images designed to trigger our desires so that we'll seek relief from our anxieties with endless purchases. And those who tweak the algorithms have learned that we buy more stuff when our anxieties are never relieved. Fear is now a technique. The news is an advertising platform. They know that if we fear one another, we'll watch them longer. We'll see more ads and send more of our money to those who profit from anxiety. Politicians have learned that our fear gives them power. Mao told his minions to oppose everything that his enemy embraced and to embrace everything that his enemy opposed. He understood human tribalism, as did Stalin before him and later Pol Pot and the Kims of North Korea. They all understood that humans find it easy to love their own group, but that they are primed and ready to hate those who are not in their group. Mao and his ministers force-fed propaganda into the minds of simple people not wise to political dogma. He turned these people into snitches and thought police living only to serve their alpha. And if the so-called counter-revolutionaries could not be found, these ordinary people turned on one another. To whatever degree we carry a spark of the divine, what we carry it in is the repurposed biology of the social ape. We can be inspired to kindly altruism or spooked into the vicious pack behavior that we see every day on social media as poked and prodded every evening by cable news. We can keep denying this if we want to. We can keep pretending that it's only those people who are mean and nasty and driven to extremes by groupthink doctrines, while we are faultlessly heroic. Or we can use the brains that God gave us. Last night I walked in the warm evening air thinking about how peaceful and humane my neighbors are and about how many of them are still hiding their faces with black cloth masks, unable to let go of the group identity triggered in them by government in response to a virus. The stores no longer require masks, but the herd can't remember how freedom feels. While I walked and bought supplies and wandered home with my groceries, I listened to a podcast. Lex Friedman, a young scientist from MIT, was interviewing Yeon Mi Park, a young woman who escaped from North Korea at 13. Friedman himself was born in the Soviet Union. These two good human beings who spent their childhoods under the thumbs of communist dictators opened their hearts to one another. Each of them was moved to tears in places. Both declared themselves to be finally home, to be Americans. Neither is blind to the miracle of free people working together in good faith or to the horror sure to follow when that good faith is lost. As you watch this video, I myself will be interviewing Wilfred Riley, the writer and professor of political science at Kentucky State. We'll be discussing these two books of his. This is the new one.
I view Professor Riley as perhaps the best candidate to fill the shoes of Thomas Sowell. Riley has Dr. Sowell's analytic rigor and a gift for communicating that's second to none. I plan to do a lot more listening than talking. Then tomorrow night, Saturday, I'll meet some of you. We'll gather at a little urban farm in Pasadena. We'll share a meal. We'll put our hands out to strangers, fully understanding that some of the hands we shake may have cast votes different from our own. Then my friends Kevin Fisher and Alma Cook and myself will each sing a few songs as the sun falls into the West. No political preachments, no snarky superiority. Just a gathering of human beings who are ready to turn the corner and start traveling the road back to the America called home by Lex Friedman in Yon Me Park. Maybe we'll find that spark of divinity each of us holds and fan it into a flame until it roars against the darkness, banishing at least for a time the beast within. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and then click the little bell to get notifications.